Hi everyone, thanks so much for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. Before we bring on tonight's guest, if you've had a Dogman Encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, please go to bigfooteyewitness.com and submit a report. All right, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest is Jay Bachochin. Jay, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me on, Vic. Appreciate it. Well, thanks so much for coming on. The honor is all ours. Jay, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, let's see. How far back do I really want to go? It all started in 1967. All right, well, we'll, we'll go up a little more with that. Honestly, I was kind of uh, born and raised on the creature features back in the 70s and uh, always loved everything supernatural or paranormal. With that said, I've always had the interest in UFOs in with ghosts. Not so much with Bigfoot, maybe Loch Ness Monster, just had this wanting to know what it was. And um, it was back in 2000 six where uh, me and my wife we celebrated a honeymoon on the east coast ended up in salem in october perfect time it's where i got interested in the ghost phenomenon and actually uh wanted to form you know a husband and wife team to hunt the truth not so much to go out because people say ghosts exist and it was on tv i wanted to hunt the truth i wanted to really either a debunk it or b prove it second and after coming back we did form a team called the wisconsin paranormal investigators and it was uh founded in uh, 2007 had a team of about 10 where we would investigate ghosts you know in businesses uh, cemeteries houses uh, some of the big establishments like uh, the ohio state reformatory and uh, I got a really good feel that there is something more to the odd and the paranormal or the supernatural, you know, to say it this way, because there are still things I couldn't even understand. So I investigated with this team up until about uh, later 2013, 2014. We kind of parted ways. It was because of one night, you know, up in the Kettle Moraine where I heard something that sounded more like a, a simian or um, an ape of some sort. And um, at that point, I didn't change the way I wanted to hunt the truth because, well, Bigfoot doesn't exist. And thus, my kind of career has stepped forward into investigating this. However, before I went to the kettle and uh heard what sounded like a i would say like i said a simian right in between us was bray road bray road is about a 13 minute drive from my house and it's infamous for the beast of bray road and we thought well this is a good time to why not drive down bray road up to the kettle moraine just to see so i would always call it patrolling and we would patrol Bray Road. It is all private owned. And um, it's not like you can get off at any point and start walking to look for any signs or anything because there's second, third, you know, generation farmers there. They all know each other and they all communicate. So the best thing to do is stay on the public road and hope for a sighting. And that's pretty much what I started doing of looking for what people were calling a dog man or i've heard of the beast being a werewolf or an upright canine and again this is somebody who hasn't seen it so i'm going to go out there and try to either a debunk it or or find the truth of what it is i am really good friends with uh linda godfrey and she's been my mentor for several years since about 2011 is when we first met so she has 
told me some stories. I, I've read her books and I was just fascinated by it. So going down Bray Road has really had me in tune to what to look for. And wow, I, I've got to tell you, it's uh, there was this one instance. Can I just go right into that instance, that encounter? Sure, that would be fine. Okay, I know we were talking about the bio. I, I kind of wanted to lead up uh, with people understanding that I hunt the truth. Uh, hunting is, you know, I could use it as a metaphor parody. I am looking for the truth. I, I want to know what the truth is. And that's pretty much everything that I have been. Uh, I don't want to say professionally, there's no experts in the field, but this is a rabbit hole that I've fallen into. And uh, with this one night, on uh, April 3rd, 2014, me and uh, one of my teammates at the time decided to do the patrolling down Bray Road. And it was late at night. We thought, wow, this would be a perfect time. I had my dash cam on. It would be great to see if uh, you capture anything. And we actually pulled off Bray onto Hospital Road. And again, you're not supposed to pull off at all because it's privately owned, but it was late. And I thought, you know what? There are no cars around. It's dark. No one's going to see us. Let's just pull the car off to the side and let's just kind of stand out here. You know, uh, my buddy Brian and I, we left the car on and we walked across the street and we were out there. For about 10 minutes, I like to film a lot, so I'm filming the moon. There was a perfect moon. I like to take pictures. It was perfectly quiet. And besides the car running, but the car was running really smooth, so you could barely hear it. And we were out there just talking, wow, this is where you know the Beast of Bray Road could be. And just then, about... I'm going to say 10 feet from the edge of the road, there was this uh, grove of trees. And just then we heard the loudest break. Now, I like to tell the story and, and try to put people into where we were at. Perfect spring night, dark, really couldn't see in front of you, except the car had the lights on on the inside, so a little bit there the loudest break. And you're talking about two grown men doing an about face immediately. We didn't have spotlights or anything. And we're like, all right, let's go. We took off. And uh, I, I do get home and uh, I, I was recording, believe it or not. I did have my audio device out at the time. And I came home and uh, Brian and I were telling my wife what we heard. And I let her listen to the recording. And her eyes didn't get as big as I thought they were because she thought, wow, that's a great sound of a 15 pound raccoon breaking a tree branch. It just, it was odd because, um, it was odd because we were out there for 10 minutes and from 10 feet away from us, from the end of the road, there was that grove of trees. So I, I'm, I'm thinking that if there was any animals out there and we were talking normally, we weren't whispering, we were talking at a, a normal sound. And I figured if there was an animal there, generally, I, I would feel like they would have been quiet or fleed. And um, it, it didn't. So I thought there was something there. And that's the part that really kind of got to me. Um, I wasn't for sure, but it was inconclusive. And so the next day, my my daughter actually lives right down the street. Uh, from Bray uh, in Elkhorn, and we we're going to go visit her that day. And it was during the afternoon. It had to have been about noon on uh, uh, April 4th, uh, 2014. That was a Saturday. And um, we went down to the same exact area. Now it's daylight. Bray Road is not an ominous type look. It is more farm field, certain grove of trees, something you would least expect of seeing some a, a creature, a werewolf or a, a dog man. And so we pull up and I showed my wife exactly where it happened. And she's like, oh, okay, that's really nice. <laughs> 
And I, I kind of said, I know, it, was, it probably was a raccoon. Uh, I was sitting in the passenger seat because I wanted her to drive so I could kind of keep my eyes open. And uh, so we're going to leave and go ahead to my daughter. So she starts to do a three-point turn right on hospital. And on her second point of her turn, I looked down on the same area where we heard the sound about a hundred yards down on the left. Now, remember, this was April and in April, everything was still brown. There was no greenery and the um, all the fields uh, were, you know, already were the cornfields were they were already, you know, it was just mud and, and, and ruts and things from tractors there. So I looked down about 100 yards and right on the edge of the grove of trees, I see like this um, auburn object and the, it, would, it just seemed out of place because it didn't look like it was um, bipedal, uh, but it didn't seem that it was going to be, a, you know, like a, a horse or a deer, like a quad on all fours. So it just looked like a mass, but it just stood out because it was, it was Auburn. And so I told my wife, I said, wait, wait, I, I want to keep going down there. So she, she stopped and we were going the direction towards the south, about a hundred yards down. And she was only doing about 10 miles an hour, 11, maybe just real slow. But I have my eyes fixated on this. Now I don't pick up my camera or my video. I don't know why, because I didn't think it was that important. It just was out of place. And as we're driving down, the closer we got to it, now my wife couldn't see exactly where I was looking at it, but my eyes were fixed on it like a bird. And I just did not let it leave my eyesight. And we're driving up closer and closer. And as I'm looking at this, it kind of, um, the only way I can really explain it is it melted within the woods. And what I mean by melted into the woods is it seemed like it just started to, I don't want to use the word disappear because, well, that just sounds crazy, but I never saw any movement of uh, walking or scurrying or anything like that. It just started turning into uh, you know, just start turning into the woods. And by the time we got to its place, I actually did take a picture, but it just looks like the edge of the wood line. And that was really fascinating to me. Again, uh, when I see things, I have to process them a little different. It wasn't hair raising or anything, but after all, this was Bray Road. And, uh, you know, the dog man story goes way far back. And I mean, not just when it was starting to be reported by Linda Godfrey back in the early 90s, but even further back than that. So I thought, wow, you know, I saw something. I, I notified Linda. Um, she was really fascinated uh, with that. And there's a really good reason for that because we did leave after that. And I just, I chalked it up to, I saw something, but I don't know what it was. Well, would you believe almost a year later, Linda called me up and said, Jay, we need to interview these witnesses. They just came forward. And I'm like, okay. She goes, this is going to knock your socks off. And I'm like, what? And she wouldn't tell me. She just says, we got to interview them. We actually interviewed them on Hospital Road in Elkhorn. And uh, we documented it. We, we did video. And lo and behold, uh, these two older couple know about the beast and they were out there doing what just about anybody who shows interest of dog man or the beast of Bray road. They were down there and they actually parked across the street on hospital. And they said about 300 yards out into the field, this is past some grove of trees. They saw what looked like they, they called it the beast and they said, it was auburn in color. It was dog-like, but it was on its knees, and it was like scuffling through the mud, looking for something. And they could they could just see, you know, mud flying and everything in the middle of the field. They could plainly see it. Now they were older, and they did have one of those flip phones that took pictures, and not very well, mind you, especially from about three hundred yards away. But the most intriguing thing about this 
it was exactly 150 miles south to where I saw mine, where I saw my Auburn shape. And it was in July of that same year. So it was just a couple months later, same stretch of road. They saw what looked like a dog man or, or a werewolf and they never had clear enough pictures, but they were 100% convinced looking through their um, binoculars from their car that it was in fact a dog man. So this goes back to what I saw again, while it wasn't hair raising, I did see it. And that was, you know, it, it was just something for, for me to always hold on to because I can't unsee something like that. And that even just intrigued me even more to keep searching around the whole roads of uh, Bray Road. If Bray Road is so seemingly uninviting for dogmen, Jay, where do you think they hole up during the day around there? Well, <laughs> that's even more intriguing because this story gets even weirder. Now, I told you that I was a, uh, I, I have been researching the Wis Wisconsin Sasquatch, but right in between the kettle and where I live is Bray Road and its surrounding area. And with that being said, where they lie, where they hide, or where they exist. And that's always a really tough part because I think that we want to, as investigators or as, well, if you want to say as science, we want to classify them and put them within what we know biologically here. So if it is a flesh and blood animal, it does have a home. It needs um, a habitat. It needs uh, water to survive, food to survive. And, you know, with that said, these surrounding areas are not having missing sheep or horse or dogs or anything like that. There's plenty of coyotes out there. So are these creatures living in that area or are they, and this can sound crazy, but, you know, are they, are they stepping through something that something like the Skinwalker Ranch, you know, where it is more of a, uh, a dimensional thing. And that is always hard for me to say, because honestly, what is a dimension? What is a portal? It's very easy to say, but it doesn't really explain how they can be here one minute and how they can't be, how they can leave uh, some tracks that just disappear in the middle of a field. And uh, I've befriended through Linda Lee Hampel, uh, really fine gentleman who owns a farm out there. And so we have taken many steps or at least, actually he started to because he wasn't aware of Dogman when he bought his farm. And uh, he learned quickly of what the legend was around there. And he started doing some investigating himself. But besides the uh, some footprints that just ended up to going nowhere him putting out three or four trail cams everywhere and catching nothing but mist or shapes not even shapes more of um, a misty shadow in one frame in the next frame it's perfectly sunlight and the bait he left out was gone after a second frame when this mist came over it again this is the area of bray road it's just its surrounding roads so we were beginning to think that maybe whatever this is, is maybe living, could be living there, could be cloaked maybe. I mean, that's, you know, far outstretched too, mm -hmm. but it, it's very much a possibility. And um, we have seen different type of orbs and lights out there in right by his house, by his barn, I should say. One night, and this was not even with Lee, this was with another investigator, uh, Sanjay. We're coming back from the kettle, and we thought we'd do some patrolling around Bray Road. And this one actually really, really kind of freaked me out because this was now about 1.30 in the morning. And we're doing patrolling, and I don't like to, I don't like to draw suspicion to myself, so I don't want to drive too slow, but I'm not trying to speed through the area either. And we were coming down 
actually it was Bowers Road. And I remember Sanjay was looking at his pictures on his phone from that evening hike. Something strange happened. And this was me driving about 15 miles an hour, trying not to draw attention, but you know, I didn't want to go too fast either. And I, I'm driving down this road, and all of a sudden, something just on the left side of the road, right on the shoulder, just stood out. Probably saw it for maybe a second, second and a half. But I kid you not, it looked like a seven-foot biped wolf looking up into the sky with its mouth open. And it was just, I caught it just that quickly. I mean, that I don't know if I maybe went down 20 or 30 feet in my car before I hit the brakes. I was going to be brave about it, scared Sanjay of what I was doing, threw it in reverse, backed up, and aimed the car out to the direction of where, where I just saw it. There was nothing there. And when I mean nothing, there was no trees, no bushes. This was an empty field, no telephone poles, nothing. So what did I just see in the middle of nothing? You know, people could say it's all suggestive thought, but I beg to differ. Whatever this thing was, uh, was not really a suggestive thought in my eyes because you just kind of know how you are. I don't, you can't conjure these things up, but this thing really just took me by. It was that fight or flight at that point where I just, I just put the car in reverse immediately, checked that out, and I could just see it looked to me like a wolf standing on two legs. The weird thing about this, and I don't know if this was the lighting, but it almost, when I saw it, almost looked like um, two-dimensional. And what I mean by two-dimensional, you know those fat heads that people will put on their walls or the stand-up ones of the famous movie characters where you can, they're totally lifelike, but you know that if you're looking at them from a certain angle, that they weren't three-dimensional. They were just a two-dimensional pop-up. And that's what this thing looked like to me. I, I could tell by the details of this, and it was just, it just, it just totally blew me away. I, I could see the hair on it, even though it was flat hair. I, I could see the, the hands raising up. I could see the mouth opened where it looked up. Again, this was a, just a snapshot in my mind going 15 miles an hour, just past it, boom, backed up, nothing there. So in this case, with all the weirdness that has been happening in that area, around that area, the stories uh, that uh, Linda's wrote about, the, the, the amount of witnesses that they have talked to, I don't think it was out of the realm that I was crazy for seeing what I did. And I've been doing that still ever since, even though I'm up in the kettle, might be in the woods. It, uh, if I'm up in the woods there and I'm coming back, I'm going to stop at Bray Road, but it, it just, it just blew my mind. And I still look for it till this day, hoping that I re see it again. I think at that point, my dash cam that I told you that I always have, well, the dash cams that I do get tend to go out every year or two. They just, some are not that good because I, I have bought some expensive dash cams that couldn't work after six months. So I said, I'm just going to get the cheap ones and just keep getting the cheap ones and just, you know, keep replacing them. This was right in between there where son of a gun. Yep. I, I would have had it. I could have proved what I saw, but I didn't. So it's really one of those hard stories to tell because it was just, it was my testimony. Not even Sanjay, who was sitting with me in the passenger chair could really identify with it. He just took it for, okay, Jay, I know you don't make this stuff up. I believe you. Now let's get out of here, <laughs> you know, because it was kind of crazy. But uh, yeah, so that was definitely a second encounter for sure. Yeah, I'm sure it's one you're never going to forget either. Never, never, ever. There are times that when I'm up in the Kettle Moraine, where I believe we're Sasquatch roams, I did come across, and I do have this as a, as a photo. It's on my uh, website. It is a seven inch canine print. And this here is 
one of the, I, I did find it in the snow, there's been the debate about the melting back on, on how you, when it melts and freezes, melts and freezes, it can expand and turn into different shapes. And even if it did or didn't, this thing was huge compared to any of the other tracks that could have been laying around there. Now, we only found the one big track, but this one really kind of blew my mind because I remember uh, documenting the the weather at that time, and we didn't have a lot of sunny, warm days and then uh, freezing in the, um, uh, you know, in the nights or anything like that. I just remember it was just, it was a constant cold, like 20 degrees, 15 degrees, I think zeros at night. So I don't think it could have ever have done that. And I was taking note of other tracks, but this one track is uh, close to four inches wide, seven inches tall, and it is definitely canine. Um, I did show this to what I believe are good experts and leading experts on this, like Linda Godfrey, and she was telling me some stories of uh, some dog man encounters that were found in the Kettle Moraine where, where I researched for Sasquatch. So sometimes I really don't know what I'm looking for anymore, but uh, I do try to be safe while I'm out there. But there was there were a couple occasions. And there's a lot of stories I, I know, but I can't really repeat some of those because those are um, you know confidential that Linda has told me of some of these people haven't gone on the record. But what I can tell you is that they definitely uh, were credible people. Let's say people with authority, let's just say. And um, uh, so it was a husband and wife, and both of them saw it. And uh, that was about 2008, 2009. So this was before I started doing this. But it's living proof that there are dogmen living in the Kettle Moraine as well. So that's another reason why I like to be extremely cautious. Yeah, that's always a good idea whenever you think dogmen might be around. I'm a little cloudy on this. Talking about the dogmen you saw that might have had a two-dimensional look to it, did you get a kind of paranormal sense from it, or did you still get the impression it was flesh and blood? No, not at all. Like, I, I did get a paranormal sense by it, but I did not... I uh, feel like it was flesh and blood because it, like I said, it looked like one of those um, stand-ups, you know, those celebrity stand-ups of cardboard where it looked two-dimensional. So it looked, it looked real, like it, it looked like a real picture, but really detailed, like being able to see the hair on its arms. I remember seeing the, it's, the claws kind of pointing up and I can remember seeing its mouth open. So it was just, that's all I saw of it. So it's just, it's another uh, a mystery of saying, you know, is the dog man flesh and blood or is it something paranormal? And that's what I'm still investigating. Yeah, that's a really hard question to answer. If you were a betting man, would you bet on them being flesh and blood or paranormal? Well, my imagination has has always been open. Uh, I look for Bigfoot, so there you go. <laughs> you know, it's a it's one of those things that I tell people that you need to keep an open mind. You can't be closed minded on it. I, I I do believe the reason why we can't find it or see it is I do believe it's more on the paranormal side of it. There has been a lot of reports of dog man hanging around cemeteries and uh, that's paranormal in itself because you know is it uh you know guarding the dead um you know in the spiritual realm of it and, and it is that's it's a you know the best answer i can give is i don't know but like you said if you're a betting man at it i would definitely have to say it's more paranormal than it is flesh and blood like your everyday coyote or wolf you know that's out there they definitely do a lot of things that make you wonder, that's for sure. So, yeah, I can understand you wondering that and feeling that way. Yeah. Having a dogman encounter is different for every eyewitness, but would you say for you that there was life before you had that first encounter and life after it, or was it business as usual for you? I, I do have a life before and after it because it wasn't, 
uh, traumatic to me, like some of these other stories that I've heard. I was in my car pretty much each time and um, knowing, uh, having an open mind of seeing something like that, that really wouldn't surprise me that it's real. But after maybe those, those, the first car in- incident and hearing that stick break was kind of, you know, we're kind of out of the car that first night and the second I was in the car, but it was during the day, you know, is at noon. Uh, this one did cause me to really think, differently (laughs) you know so driving on it you know it's not that i'm uh scared to drive down that road but i'll tell you even if i did that right now tonight i would always have that eerie feeling so to answer your question yeah i believe it after that sighting it it did change me because now i'm thinking you know anytime i drive down this road where is it going to end up and what's it going to look like It's one of the hardest parts. Like I said, a two-dimensional look that doesn't look flesh and blood wasn't there, but there was no way that I misidentified it because there was nothing in that field at all. I mean, at all. Just try to picture an empty cornfield and putting your headlights out there. That's what I saw. So I'm like, what did I see? Definitely, I think it's more paranormal and... um it definitely did change me, but it wasn't as traumatic as if it, you know, something attacked me or anything like that. Maybe I, I would stick away from Bray Road if something like that happened. That's an awfully strange experience. Yeah, I <laughs> guess that would be awfully hard to wrap your head around. Definitely. Like you've established already, you research Dogmen and Sasquatch. Between the two, which one do you enjoy researching more and why? Uh, personally right now, I, I believe it's more Sasquatch and I believe it is more flesh and blood because I have found more evidence, uh, being out in the Kettle Moraine. I've had three different sightings of uh, one of them looking like an oversized chimpanzee, like bigger than man size on all fours, looking like it's moving behind a tree, but it was like this oversized chimpanzee I was looking at was like on a cart with wheels and it was just pulled away. I've never seen anything move so fluently and smooth. And I saw that, you know, you know, I, I, I could question the dog man because I think it's more paranormal versus a flesh and blood, something that I can sleuth around with, you know, with a magnifying glass and, you know, look for different prints or different signs of, of, um, anything that they could leave behind, um, or, you know, being out there and experiencing this smell. At the same time, you just got to remember that's what I feel like I'm enjoying doing. Linda, on the other hand, thinks that I could be experiencing dog man as well, because while I've been out in the kettle moraine day or night, there are times when I'm out there and I feel like, I'm in my living room, just comfortable, you know, sitting on the couch, just relaxed. And there's times when I'm out there where I feel like I'm just being watched and peered at, you know, it just, um, you know, we've not jumping around, but just thinking of these three sets of laser red eyes that uh, three of us experienced back in 2016, just staring at us from the dark. We could easily assume because we're looking for Bigfoot, that's what it was but we really don't know. And I've, I've heard of, like I said, I've heard of a lot of encounters of dog man being out there. However, I'm still alive to tell the tale, these tales. So I, I, I there, there's something about falling down this, this uh, never ending abyss rabbit hole. And um, I started falling down this thing in 2013 and I'm still falling. And I don't know when ever I will, you know, recover from that or ever hit the bottom or ever find the truth but it's just it's just what i enjoy doing going out in the woods and looking for at least evidence i want to be have an open mind with everything that i do but at the same time you do need physical evidence or anything captured just to try to help identify this next piece of the puzzle 
I'm glad to hear that you enjoy it so much. Yeah, you're a good man, and it's great to hear that you're out there in the forest, beating the bushes, having a great time looking for them. That's great to hear. <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, you've got to be a little bit crazy to do the things that I do, and it it's not like you're jumping out of a plane with a very good parachute. It's not that crazy, but at the same time, it's incredibly crazy because you don't know where you're putting yourself as far as danger. And these are both Dogman and Sasquatch are, are something that, that pulls me out from the comfort of my own home and my own family to gear up and, and just go out into the darkness and, and try to hunt that truth and, and try to solve that. It's a lot of people always ask, what are you solving it for? You know, do you want to be the first one to solve it? Write that book, you know, put that feature a documentary out, which I have, but for other reasons, is it's not it's not a popularity. It's not who gets there first. It's not about uh, fame or fortune for me. It's about the truth. And actually, it'd be a great truth to come back and show my wife to say, "Look, it's real." So stop rolling your eyes at me when I come home. She does support me, <laughs> but uh, you know that's what I just enjoy doing, and to be able to to share the truth, just like we're doing tonight i feel like i'm trying to give the most i can out to the public that is like mind like like us that want to know from you know a normal i don't want to say normal person i don't know what a normal person is who does what they do but to be able to say these are the encounters that i've had and they definitely were hair raising at one point and um you know just talking about this tonight I'll be heading back out in the woods probably this weekend, and uh, that's always on my mind. So uh, I definitely enjoy doing what I'm doing. It takes a lot of sand to go out into the woods the way you do and look for dogmen when you know they are probably around, maybe even watching you. So, yeah, you deserve a lot of credit. It takes a lot yeah. of moxie to do that. Thanks, Vic. I appreciate that. Oh, you're welcome. Just telling the truth. You've mentioned the Kettle Moraine State Forest in Wisconsin several times now. For the uninitiated, what can you tell us about the place? The Kettle Moraine, it is the woods that has been made by the, the glaciers that created the Great Lakes that came through back on um, the Ice Age. And what, this, what the Kettles is, is a, a 55,000 uh, square acres of dense woods, hills, that's the kettles. Some of our 300 feet uh, that go down like valleys and they come back up kind of like a kettle. And that's the reason why they named it the Kettle Moraine. But we have the utmost cover of wildlife, the perfect habitat for any large creature, I believe, to live there with plenty of food of rabbits and uh, deer and, and all the, the night critters like raccoon and possum and uh, plenty of little lakes and ponds. And the Kettle Moraine actually stretches over 150 miles through um, Wisconsin going up, just kind of like this, gr think of a green belt that goes all the way up through the state of Wisconsin before it hits the, the Great Northern Woods, which then of course heads up and goes into Michigan, which is just wide open. So I believe that there is this this uh, green belt called the Kettle Moraine. There's a northern unit and a southern unit. And you can look on, I, I always tell people when they try to like look at it from a, um, a Google satellite view where it doesn't look like much, but I'll tell you just one little pin drop of where we investigate, you can be turned around and lost forever. So it's a, it's a great national uh, park. It's uh, they do have, uh, trails for people to horseback ride on, bike ride, hiking when it snows, snowmobile trails, some are cross country trails. So it's definitely a place where they want you to come out and enjoy. They even have campgrounds. So there's a lot that goes on within the kettle from the southern unit all the way up to the northern unit. I just happen to like to go to certain areas at night to weed out any human contamination to give me any false positives so it's a definitely a place to visit and i highly recommend it it seems very safe so far for me 
And the way you describe it, yeah, sounds like a mecca for dogmen. What more could they ask for? Oh, exactly. And uh, like I said, there has been some people, very credible people, that actually saw a dogman out in the kettle in one of the areas that I researched uh, back in 2006. And uh, I wish I could get more into that, so sorry to tease you on that one. But um, that one is always going to stick with me because when I'm out there hiking, even during the day, there are times where it's a very unsettling feeling. And, um, you know, if you're going to go out there and you're going to look for Dogman or, or Bigfoot, people say, well, you're going to find it because it's all suggestive thought. And I, and I agree with that. But when you're doing this for over seven years straight, you start to just enjoy it for who you're going out there with and just having a good day hike, turning off technology and uh, just enjoying nature. So it definitely a place I, I believe would definitely house a, a dog man for, for sure. But again, I'm always thinking, well, I have also found huge footprints that would be more on the, the evidence of, of Bigfoot and uh, some behaviors that I have experienced out there. I don't know if that would be so much a dog man behavior. So that's where the cross is on it. But who knows? You know, Linda said maybe they battle for territory, Sasquatch and Dogman, which would be a, a great, um, you know, great one for the books watching these two titans fight. Yeah, that it would be. I definitely would want my popcorn to watch that. From what I understand, you have a 12 year old research partner who goes out with you sometimes. What more can you tell us about him? Well, that would be my son, Blake. And um, Blake never had a chance since he was born into my life of weirdom. You know, our our kids are a product of the parents. And, uh, you know, besides being a good Chicago Bears fan living here in, in Wisconsin, <laughs> he has also taken on the investigating skills, which I have taken him out in the woods since he was about four years old. We'd go during the day and we'd go to some very, um, you know, popular spots where there are people and uh, just take him out in nature. And uh, we do this quite a bit. So he's uh, 12 going on 13, or actually he's 12 going on 21, it seems, but he's just getting better and better at looking at things in more of a scientific way now, instead of being a uh, little and seeing, um, you know, a horseshoe print that uh, he would say, wow, that looks like a foot daddy. Now he's able to tell, wow, you could see the tread in that print or in that impression in the ground. So I'm really proud of him. He's been using uh, the flare thermal and he's been using uh, his monoculars and he's, you could see his mind churning. So, you know, I keep thinking, what did I create? You know, I mean, he was, <laughs> He's my buddy. He's a good reason. He's a good research partner, but I'm like, what did I create? And he's looks forward to going out into the woods with me. And he knows dad looks for Bigfoot, but, um, he did have a sighting in 2017, uh, which is in my documentary, but, uh, it, it's one of those things for him too, where it's, he will look at things and, uh, try to figure out he he'll use he'll use uh being on the fence because i always said that you could be on the fence uh on the left side you have total skepticism and on the right you're a total believer you know what does the believer or you know now there's a knower who who experienced something like this so he, he, my son he's like well i'm on the fence you know my foot's kind of tapping on the believe side which is good i want him to keep his uh imagination and open mind going and uh keep doing what he's doing because honestly at the end of the day whether you know you you're hearing my voice right now whether you believe it or not what i tell people and this is the best advice i could tell you is if you're that interested in it go out and discover it for yourself because you know what people say jay you're gonna you're gonna find a bigfoot out there because that's all you think about or you're gonna see a dog man on Bray Road because you want to see it. And then you know what my answer is? I say, you know what? If people are going to go out and turkey hunt, guess what? They're going to find turkeys. Just saying. If you're going to go out and look for something, 
most likely you're going to find it. And that's the approach I do. I just try to keep my options open um, on some. I, I never hike alone at night. I don't bring my son uh, out late at night. Usually it's the people that have my back or I have their back type of thing. Uh, but if there's not nights that I can't hike with anybody, uh, me and my son will go out and drive the back roads of Wisconsin. Uh, I don't limit everything to just a Bray Road. You know, that's 13 minutes away. There's got to be something around here somewhere. And believe it or not, 2017, in a a neighboring town that's about five minutes from here, let's call her Christine. I get a phone call from somebody at uh, my church who said, you got to call my daughter. She just saw a hellhound. And I'm like, what? A hellhound? She goes, just call her. Her name's Christine. Here's her number. I call her. When she answers the phone, I, I explained to who I was. When she answered the phone, she was so upset still. Such high anxiety of still shaking up. And I'm like, well, what, what happened? She's like, I go this way every day to go pick up my son uh, or not my son, I'm sorry, my fiance in uh, Lake Geneva every single day. And I go down the same road every night. And it's not too far from her house. She said she was driving. And um, this was probably about 11 o'clock at night on a Friday night. And she is coming around what is uh, kind of a bend in the road before it gets up to a main highway. As she's coming around, she sees this object in the middle of the road but her headlights are just barely touching it she's getting closer to it she's she's approaching with caution because she didn't know what it was and she said she could almost see the profile but then the eyes turned green just glowing green so you know she's thinking maybe it's the eye shine uh from her headlights onto whatever is there you know but it just seemed like a mass She's getting closer than an, an oncoming car is starting to come the other way towards it. All of a sudden, she said this thing stood up. And she said, Jay, this thing was huge. I'm talking nine feet. The thing had to have been about three people wide. She said three men wide, tapered down to kind of a, a waist, but she couldn't really see the feet and she said the thing didn't run away it galloped it was the weirdest thing i've ever seen so i couldn't tell if it was human or a dog or she said or a dog or a wolf and i said wow maybe you saw a dog man and she goes what's a dog man so these are people that don't know anything about the subject and all of a sudden they see something like this now the incredible thing about that is that's literally five minutes from my house so you just said did that ever change you? And I said, well, it didn't seem like it gave me any, you know, I wasn't terrified or anything like that. But guess what? This is kind of the country where I'm at. I have to take my garbage out to the street during garbage night. And I do think about not Sasquatch, but I think about Dogman being that close. So it's definitely really crazy. And I try to play it safety first, but uh, whatever this is, is real. I just, don't know flesh and blood versus paranormal. Oh, they're definitely real, unfortunately. You said your son's getting better at researching. Has he ever noticed anything while you guys were out in the field researching that you missed? Yes, uh, he has found, well, what we say are X's in the woods. Those are the two trees that make an X. And I always tell him if we're on a path, and you see something just off the path, I'm going to say 99.9% .9 of the time, it's going to be done by nature or not so much nature, but maybe a person that could create that. And uh, he is, but he has found some that were deeper in the woods than not so much, you know, way off the path, but uh, where he could actually see it about 20 feet into the woods and then we would actually get off the path and go out there and lo and behold these normal stick structures that people talk about these were two huge 12-foot branches put together in an x that were not part of any species 
of the trees around. So they were definitely placed there. But this is something where I'm like, my son just has that eye for it. I'm looking for it too, but maybe I'm looking for, you know, another huge chimpanzee coming out. But he spots those sticks, but he also spots the ones that are just caused by nature. And he'll do that with uh, with anything that he finds on the ground because he is looking on the ground to see if he can find any prints. And um, when was it? Uh, this was just a week ago. We went out during the day, a beautiful day out in the kettle, just uh, him and I. And we came across a fallen, looked like a birch that just fell in the middle of the path. And um, the, the good thing about that is because he wanted to know if it was dead. And the first thing he did is he went to go look at the top part of the tree, which was totally green leaves on it. And uh, we walked over and sure enough, the ball root is still there. So we knew it didn't die or fall over just because it was dead. Again, we don't know if it was a weak soil base or, you know, if there were high winds. But if there were high winds, we were trying to debunk that. You know, my son said, well, look how tall these other trees are. How is this one tree affected by the wind to get knocked over? So it's things like that where my son really is, uh, his mind just is, work. It's, a, it's a machine now. And uh, that's why I said he's 12 going on 21 is he gets it. He knows what we're looking for as far as what the truth is so yeah he's he's definitely picked out a lot of things out there he sure sounds precocious to me he also sounds like a natural i'm impressed yeah well i told him and i said not to be morbid i just said hey you know what when daddy's gone one day are you going to be my legacy you know to keep going out and hunting the truth and he said yeah, you know, he goes, I do want to be a, a, a YouTube animator, but maybe in my spare time, I, I can look for those. It's funny because, you know, the kids at this age can actually split into many different things, but he does enjoy doing it, whether it's a lifelong passion for him or he just loves to spend time with his dad. Yeah, I guess only time will tell. I wouldn't be surprised if he does dig in and jump in with both feet and Stay isn't for the long haul, but like I said, uh, I guess only time will tell on that. Yeah, for sure. Well, Jay, it's about time for us to get out of here. But before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Well, what I'd like to say, and it's like what I'd like to tell people that that hear this, is that it's it's true. There there are things that we don't understand that are out there whether it is Dogman or Sasquatch or Ghost or UFOs, it's real, but you can't take my word on it. Go out, be safe, and discover for yourself. You'll be amazed at what you find once you start looking for it. But again, I always tell people, be safe, be cautious, be smart, but go out and discover for yourself. I think you'll find it. Yeah, well, like you said earlier, be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. Well, that's true, especially if it is a dog, man. Maybe look for it and discover it for yourself in a tank. You never know, but you know, like that's the, the smart part about it. It's not so much go out into the woods and not be protected or not hike with anybody. Or There's a lot of strange things that are going out there, but the only way you'll ever find it is by discovering it for yourself and not through, you know, anybody's testimony. I, I can help validate things, but to believe, you'll find it. That's usually what I like to give incentive, you know, inspiration to people to do. Well, that's all very well said, Jay. Jay, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all those experiences with us. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for having me on, Vic. I truly appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and your audience. Well, it's been great having you. Thanks again so much. Have a great night. If you've had a Dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.